Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to talk about G-Event, an event loop for Python. Wait, we already had one of those. No, this one's better. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 238, recorded January 16th, 2013. G-Event. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open-source software. I'm your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing to you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the small projects, projects you might not have heard of, projects you may be using every day and not knowing it. All those great variety of projects. It's an awesome responsibility for me to do that every week, but an awesome privilege as well, and a really enjoyable one at that. Uh, each week, I am joined by a lovely co-host. Oh, I said that again. I didn't mean to say it that way. Anyway, a wonderful <laughs> co-host. Let's put it that way. No less this week, it's Dan Lynch. Dan Lynch, welcome back to the show. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. I was quite flattered with being described as, as lovely. It doesn't happen that often, so thank you. I'll take that. <laughs> and, and where are you speaking to us from? I'll ask you that, because I don't yeah. only... Yeah, I'm in Liverpool in England, which many of you will know, uh, obviously, I, uh, from the Beatles, as everybody knows. Uh, so I, I don't know any of the Beatles. I get asked that a lot when I go to America and other places. Oh, do you know the Beatles? And all this, but I'm, I'm afraid I don't. But uh, I am from the same area, same neck of the woods, as we say. Actually, around here. actually they probably left long before you were born, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, yeah. Um, I'm thinking, yeah, a long time ago. Well, I, yeah, 19, 1980. I may look older, but 1980, yeah. So the Beatles had well, well gone by the time I came around. The Beatles had broken up before you were born. Mm, yeah, that's right. I think it's a long time ago. Definitely a long time ago. Well, 70, yeah. 1970, I think they bro broke up. Yeah, so 10 yeah. years before. Well, Dan, it's 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 a pleasure having you back on the show uh, on our second show of this brand new year. Um, we have a really great guest for today. Let me uh, see my notes here. So it's Dennis, uh, I think it's Balinko. Dennis Balinko uh, should be close, something like that. He's going to talk to us about G Event, which is a Python asynchronous platform or multi-threaded platform. I, I'm trying to get it from reading through the uh, website. It's uh, it's a little odd, I think. Uh, and it's funny because I started looking at this and I went, oh, wait, we already did one of those. Uh, just a, uh, like a, f a couple dozen shows ago, we had uh, Twisted On, which was a uh, Python framework to allow multiple threads of operation happening at the same time. Uh, I think this is a little bit different, though. I think it's because it uses more low-level uh, C calls and things like that. So uh, we'll have to get them to actually compare it with Twisted somewhere in the show. I'm sure we'll be able to get to that. Um, have you looked much into this, Dan? I've been doing some research on it today, actually. Um, nothing like last-minute research. And uh, I've, I have actually had, had, had a look into it. Uh, it looks really, really interesting. But I'm curious to know, uh, as I'm sure many people are, I don't want to sound harsh, but why we need another one uh, another one of these kind of solutions and what it's actually bringing um so it'd be interesting to find out what answers he's got to those kind of questions well the great thing about frameworks is there's so many of them i mean it's it, it mm -hmm. and, and they you know if, if there's a problem to be solved there will be a lot of people all sort of addressing the same problem and uh you know we have the we definitely have the problem in Perl where we have so many different ways of doing templating and i i in python there's all, all these different ways of doing some sort of like web framework like we've had a bunch of them on the show actually like django and things like that so mm -hmm. i you know i i can see you know it, each if there's a niche to fill it's going to be filled in different ways so it should be pretty interesting to uh to figure out how to do that um i also just want to say before we get into the show and bring Dennis on uh, special thanks again to my new client, NAMI Media, for providing the office space for me to be able to tape the show. Uh, I'm on the 13th floor, believe it or not, of the Howard Hughes building. And yes, in fact, mm. this is the building that's adjacent to the promenade where we had the hostage situation last week. And I was unable to come to work on Friday because the police had the building surrounded. So um, a little uh -huh. weird. So if you've heard some news out of L.A. from last week where there was a hostage situation, yes, in fact, that was adjacent to this building. So uh, uh, where they were holding some uh, 14 people in a mall. 
hole and there was uh, there was a, a stabbing and everything it was really really tragic but uh, I hear they caught the guys so that's good um, but anyway yeah in fact it, for those who were curious I saw a couple people in, in the chat room ask about that so um, yeah this, this in fact is the building that was next to that mall that you might have heard about last uh, Friday in the news anyway uh, enough on that anything else before we get started Dan? No, I was just going to say, make sure you stay safe. It sounds like uh, an exciting neighborhood that you're in. It, it's a, Well, you know, West L.A. is not supposed to be this way. It's supposed to be East L.A. <laughs> and that's the problems. I'm on the West Side. I'm the West Side, dudes. I'm on the West, west Side. side. <laughs> right. So I, this should be no problem. I mean, I, well, I am just north of LAX. And I think that's that's always considered a bit of a seedy neighborhood being near the uh, airport like that. But uh, yeah, I think I'll be okay. Anyway, so without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on our guest. Dennis, I think it's Bilenko. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, uh, hi, thanks for inviting me. Yes, and where are you speaking to us from? I'm in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Very cool. I've actually been there, uh, I think about uh, four months ago. I did a cruise out of Amsterdam that went up the, was it the Rhine River just outside of Amsterdam? Um, no, I don't think so. I, I, I have been living there for a few months just uh, sort <laughs> Okay, it was some <laughs> river, I think. I'm pretty sure it was in Amsterdam because I remember it. I all think the it's still. I think it's still, not Rhine. Okay, because I remember all the bike paths, and I remember almost getting run over by by hordes of bikes that are, are trying to go somewhere. But maybe, no, is that right? Maybe I was in a different city. I'm pretty sure it was in Amsterdam, but we'll see. Anyway, so uh, at the beginning of the show, I actually talked about as much as I was aware of of G event, or I, I don't know if you pronounce that as Gavent or G event, but uh, I gave sort of the thirty thousand foot view level. Can or, or I gave sort of like the overview. Can you give us what Geovant is and why, uh, what problem it might solve. Yeah, sure. So Geovant is an asynchronous framework at the core uh, for Python, like Twisted or Tornado, but with coroutines built on top of that. So you get uh, all the benefits of an asynchronous framework, like an ability to manage tens of thousands of connections without uh, much memory, but you can still write your application in a normal way, like you would if you had only one connection to worry about. The, so this is called cooperative threading, and GVN provides this cooperative threads, and they're actually more lightweight than uh, real OS threads. So you can, uh, and it's possible, and people do it, take your multi-threading application written for Python and uh, run it on top of GVN and have it use less memory and less virtual machines and, and so on. And one of the nicest things about Gvent is that it can take a library or a framework, web framework like Django or Flask or Redis Py. This, there's a, a whole bunch of Python libraries that are not written with an asynchronous framework in mind. But with Gvent, you can run them uh, asynchronously. Uh, yeah, so in short, it's an async framework without complexity and drawbacks associated with uh, callbacks. Yeah, I hope hope that makes sense. Okay, so so if I'm using this, I'm, I'm trying to do multiple things simultaneously, or at least have the appearance of doing them simultaneously. And you said it's it's more lightweight than like traditional th uh, threads uh, that that yeah. my operating system might provide. Can you can you explain what why that's so? Oh uh, well, uh, because. Uh, the, the OS threads currently, they're improving, but they currently are associated with overhead. You have to allocate a few megabytes of stack memory up front. There is switching overhead. And on top of that, if you do multi-threading application, you need to take care of synchronization and stuff. That also adds overhead. With Gvent, what you have is user-level cooperative threads. So what it actually does is does this stack switching capability provided by an extension called GreenLayer. I can talk about it later. But sure. what it does is uh, just replaces your stack without any syscalls and without using this uh, big chunk of uh, stack memory uh, uh, allocated in advance. So, okay. yeah, okay. yeah th that's the case now that the OS threads have used more resources than they should. It gets improved and maybe someday they will be like more lightweight, but right now you have coroutines uh, having using less resources than uh, real OS threads. Now, I understand you're the creator of G-Event, and what problem were you trying to solve when you created it? Uh, I was writing a network application for some time before Python in C++. 
So at the job about 2008, I had a, like to write another network server in Python. And at the time, was like the the choice was to do a Twisted, the, the, another Python framework that mm-hmm. based around callbacks. And uh, Twisted is good, like great quality code. But uh, I really looked for a better way than just making this chain of callbacks. And I know that there is, I knew that there is a better way because I have take a look at Erlang, for instance, which has this microprocessor that you can spawn in huge numbers. So I was wondering if you could do this in Python. And then I found about this uh, library is called Greenlet and uh, Eventlet and also Stackless Python, which is uh, is really relevant, but not used directly. And uh, they do exactly what I wanted to. They give you this asynchronous interface on top of the of synchronous interface, on top of the event loop. Mm-hmm. And it's cooperative lightweight trading. So I get involved with that library, with event last started contributing, uh, took over the maintenance at some point, and then I decided to start a new project because I thought I could do better if I start from scratch and get rid of some backward compatibility issues. And so you created this library to help you develop these network applications. Uh, yeah, what, that's right. uh, uh, sorry, that's right. Yeah, I just said that's right. Yeah, okay. And, uh, okay, so so what what does it look like to me as a programmer as I'm interfacing with uh, G-Event? What, 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 what am, what's different about the way I would write code for this compared to, say, just writing traditional linear code? Pretty much nothing, nothing is different. You have to know maybe a few JVN specific calls, like how to create a new cooperative thread, but it's just one function. Pretty much is the same API as a traditional multi threading. You have events, queues, you have channels. Uh, excuse me? Mm-hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're fine. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so you have a lot of similar uh, similar primitives that you have in multi-trading. They just uh, re-implemented for this cooperative environment. And in fact, what in G-Event you can do is replace Python multi-trading primitives with these cooperative ones and have your application unchanged to work with cooperative threads instead of uh, real ones. So yeah, it closely resembles the multi-trading uh, applications. And so if I want to take, if I want to do something that is normally very complex and break it up so that multiple, um, multiple cores, for example, if I have a multi-core machine and I have something that's CPU intensive and I want to try to figure out a way to break it up into like eight parallel threads or something, how, how do the different threads talk to each other? Uh, well, first of all, this is uh, like uh, at the core, it's, it's an event loop. It's all driven by the event loop. Okay. And so this is for I.O. bound application. If you have a CPU intensive task, you need to offload it to thread pool or process pool. You cannot mm-hmm. just uh, do it in process because just with any async framework, you will just starve your event loop. So that's the first thing. And uh, what was uh, the question again? So how I was just do trying you to figure pre- how, yeah, how, how, how do the different threads communicate with each other? How, do, how, do, how can I manage you know, what threads are working on what? Uh, you mean cooperative threads? Because in, yes. in Jiva, you actually have a thread pool if, for real threads, if you like. If you real have a real CPU intensive task, you can spawn it in a thread pool okay. and get the result back. But with cooperative threads, uh, that depends. You can just spawn a thread and ask for its result back. You can have channel for like uh, moving, unlocking the thread based on a uh, send and receive primitives. You can have event where multiple threads are subscribed to one. For instance, if you have a chat room and you want everyone to wake up and receive updates, you can use an event, the same as in uh, multi-threading. You can even have semaphores, although with cooperative multitasking, the switches, the contact switches only occur at the points where I.O. happens. So in most cases, you can avoid this synchronizing the data that you use in your application, which makes it more easier to write and uh, less likely to make mistake. So with something like this, it's probably more suited then for I.O.-driven events, like, say, a um, you know a web server or some sort of a chat client or something then. 
Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the same. It's the same scope, the same target as Twisted Node.js and all async frameworks. It just looks like threading, but and this is just to make the programmer happier. Um, write linear code instead of uh, callback-based code. So it is for I/O bound application. That's absolutely for sure. Okay, so I could write uh, something, and I think uh, I think in Python you call this uh, WSGI. It's sort of the uh, universal interface for web applications, so that different frameworks can plug into that. So th this would be some way to write something that's above that to actually serve WSGI um, um, uh, servers. Yeah, exactly. And actually, Gvent includes the WSGI, WSGI server. So any web framework, and nowadays it's like all of them, that supports WSGI can just run through Gvent and enjoy the scalability of an async framework. Even though these web frameworks were designed with uh, multi-threading in mind and Apache to uh, host. Okay, well that sounds uh, really cool. Um, so what's what's the current state of it? Is it is it is this production ready? Are, are you using this in any large applications? Uh, yeah, it's used in a, in a number of companies. It's used. Uh, Spotify uses it. It's used by a chat uh, chat service called Amigo which hosts like 10,000 or 20,000 people chatting online. It's used by even Wikipedia. Uh, has a service for rendering PDFs from page and it manages, it renders like hundreds of thousands of uh, PDFs daily, 100,000 PDFs daily. And that is managed by Gvent. And yeah, lots of, lots of companies doing production stuff with it. And the current state mm. is we had version zero based on LibEvent. Uh, the, the event loop now we have a new version 1.0 based on LibEV, which is about to be, uh, to, to be released. And uh, both branches are used in production. Mm. So um, can, you, can you tell us a bit more about LibEv then? Um, how does that work and how does it relate? Uh, lib, LibEvent? Lib, lib yeah. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is uh, these are the event loops written in C. So uh, you can have uh, wrappers for EPOL, uh, KQ, and timer management written in Python, and that's what Twisted does, for example. But you can also take these libraries that do it in C, and it uh, because of because just because it's in C, and uses well the data structures suitable for C, it, it's much faster. So. In G, I'm not interested in writing the event loops. I'm more interested in the coroutine part. So that's why I just picked like the best event loop available, and that was LibEvent uh, when I when I started it. And then I switched to LibEv because well, it fixed some bugs for me. And in the future, we might uh, I might even switch to something else like a Node.js project develops an event loop called LibEv, and it also has some nice properties and nice features. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I was looking at uh, Greenlet, which um, when I was doing some research on on uh, GEvent, which is um, you're actually based on or you're using as part of uh, as part of GEvent. So, what how does how does Greenlet work, and how is it related? I believe it's a, it's a spin off of Stackless Python. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, that, that's right. So uh, Stackless Python is a is a it has quite an old history. It was started in 2000, year 2000, by Christian Tismer, and it added a few features to Py to Python. It added uh, micro threads. It added ability to like pause the micro threads, switch context, this kind of thing. You could even uh, pause your thread, micro thread, uh, pickle it, uh, serialize it, and uh, replay it later. So it has all of these nice features. But unfortunately, and I think it's like big. Uh, well, unfortunate, isn't it? It's not got merged into C Python, so we have these two c separate version uh, versions of Python. And then uh, Armin Rigo from PyPy Project extracted the stack switching functionality from uh, Stackless and packaged this as a just C extension. And what it does is uh, it actually a technique that can be used on not just on Python program but on any C program on maybe other C based interpreters. It literally takes like a pieces of C stack, uh, saves it on the heap, and uh, replaces it with a uh, with uh, the stack with the stack that you of the coroutine that you are going to switch to. So that wow. is, it's called it's called this hard switching to, and it has some assembly code for like the all major platforms to save the registers properly. And it sounds crazy, but it works uh, really nice. 
in applications. And it gives you like true coroutines, true full stack coroutines that are absolutely necessary to implement uh, this, the functionality that uh, GVAN provides. I, yeah, I know a lot of our audience is probably familiar with what a coroutine is, but uh, since you're obviously an expert in this, can you explain a little better about why I might want to have a coroutine? Uh, well, coroutine first is like a term that uh, contains many different kinds, many different types. There's like classification of coroutines. For example, in Python, there is this yield keyword, which also sometimes called coroutine. And what it does is that the function state, instead of just returning from a function, you pause the state, you save all the local variables, and then you can resume it later. Mm -hmm. But what what Greenlet does is it goes even further. It's if if it's native uh, Python coroutines, you can just save the top level stack uh, frame, and you need to explicitly manage it with yield. With Greenlet, you can even switch if you go deep down uh, several uh, stake frames, mm -hmm. and even if you go into C, because Python uh, is a lot of interaction with C, lots of libraries written in C. Even if you go in C, that also can be switched. Because, well, the way it works, just by taking the stack and saving on the heap. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, so this is two very different types of coroutines. But in the end, it's like the same. It's the ability to switch and, and restore context. And if you add event loop to it, which is what Jeevan does, you get like a thread-like abstraction, which are driven by the event loop. So instead of saying, I'm reading from the socket, I call this callback when there's some data. You say hmm. receive from the socket, and this uh, the whole uh, green thread gets paused until there is some data, and then it gets resumed again with the data passed back to the caller. So it gives you impression of like a blocking regular call, but it actually does this uh, switching underneath. So every time you want some blocking operation, there's a dedicated uh, greenlet that just runs the event loop, and that you want some some operation to block, you switch to the event loop. And then event loop switches back to your current green light, uh, well, giving you the result of what you wanted for. So, so in in terms of my coding, I I write it like it's a real blocking call. I just say, please read a line from this socket, and I it looks to me in this thread like I'm just sitting there waiting for this. Even though what's really happened is my whole thread has been swapped out, and some other things are running over here based on swapping the entire stack with this technology you're talking about. Yeah, that's right. Cool. And it's, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, real OS threads uh, cannot do this with unnecessary performance, but I think it could be, I think the kernel gets improved and the uh, uh, user space libraries gets improved. And uh, maybe at some point in the future, the Kernel threads will be fast enough to just do this without any of this uh, coroutines and without event loops. Uh, why why don't the standard thread libraries work like this? I, I, it seems like that would be the obvious thing was to take the stack and drop yeah. it into the heap. Um, I'm not sure because first of all, the, the, the standard libraries solve a much harder problem, right? They are preemptive threads. They oh, want okay. to switch out the thread even if the thread like doing something and not yielding in any way, not doing any I.O. And this kind of threads only switch like if you explicitly, if the thread itself decides to give up control. So it's, a, it's a, maybe it's the task is a bit easier in this case of I.O. bound application. That's why I can uh, cheat a little bit and this uh, uh, faster things. So, so the, this library that you're, are, are you built on top of Greenlet or are you just doing something somewhat like Greenlet? Um, right now, the current version of Greenlet uh, is built on top. Uh, the, the current version of Gvent is built on top of Greenlet. But I have, in fact, been like experimenting with doing this switching and event loop in C so that I can uh, have a much better performance and just wrap the, the result in C library in Python. Because as I said, well, event loop is in C already, and the, what Greenlet does is nothing specific to Python. It's just stack switch, and it also works in C, actually. So, yeah, in fact, next version of Gvent might be doing something like Greenlet without actually using Greenlet. Okay, uh, and I have a question from the chat room. We have a Brent11 who's asking, is G-Event integration with Django difficult or straightforward? 
Uh, it should be straightforward, but you should understand that you don't just use Django, you also use something like database driver. And this is where usually uh, people get problems. For instance, if you use Postgres, PsychoPG2 module has like special uh, helper for G-Event. So you can just call a specific function and it will use G-Event well, capabilities to switch out. But if you're on MySQL, then you need to make sure that either your uh, driver is Python or you uh, run it through Jetpool. Because uh, G-Event can only turn a synchronous library into a synchronous if it's written in Python. If it's in C, then I cannot uh, cannot get into it, cannot replace the sockets with this uh, cooperative sockets, and you need to use Stratpool. So the question is, Django is easily uh, usable with Jivan. The question is your database driver. You need to look like what people do. But I know that people use both MySQL and Postgres uh, with Jivan, and I myself use Postgres, and I've seen people using MySQL, so it should be fine. So, so the, in order for this to actually work, you have to basically override or interrupt anything that might be blocking, like a socket call then. And you have to yeah, make sure exactly. that that's calling back to your code, right? Yeah, exactly. So there's a, a module, a helper module in Jeevan package called jeevan.monkey. Well, because it, what it does is usually called monkey patch. And mm -hmm. it, it, it has like this, if you have a socket in standard library and you implement a very uh, similar interface with uh, with Jeevan. And in Jeevan, we actually well, went to great lengths to ensure that our socket is very similar in interface to the standard socket. We actually tested with standard tests we test. We have lots of tests to make sure that it's. If you sw swap or switch it with the standard socket, mm -hmm. it will be uh, compatible. So what we do is just Python allows you to do this. Go into standard module, replace socket class with our class, and it mm -hmm. becomes uh, cooperative. And we do it with threads. The thread become cooperative threads, and a few more things that. Not not all. So you need to watch for some things. For instance. Uh, if you do file system and you're on FS, it's currently not patched, so you need to do it through thread pool if you really want, uh, if you really want it to be uh, asynchronous. And so, how does uh, we, we had Twisted on the show about uh, six months ago? Uh, how does this compare with Twisted? Uh, it, it it compares that so the similarities are that both are event, both are asynchronous frameworks. Both use sure. ePoll or PyQ. But the difference is that Twisted builds on top of callbacks. So you need to specify, call, you need to switch your uh, sequence, your action into series of callbacks. So as soon as you got something blocking, you need to say, well, defer it, add callback, add airbag, and uh, you split your program into these callbacks. With G event, well, you don't have that. This, like, a, in my opinion, is the main reason. The other mm -hmm. reason is that because I use uh, event loop written in C, which the Twisted Defense just w weren't available when Twisted was implemented in 10 or 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's uh, actually somewhat faster. Uh, and there are people, for instance, the Megal.com chat used to use Twisted, and about 5,000 concurrent users, they have this 100% of CPU uh, used by this process. And then they rewrite it in G-Event, and then now they can scale one process to 10,000. Of course, eventually they just add more processes, but this is kind of comparison from real deployment of uh, performance. So it it's, can be called more performant and also uh, easier to use. That's, that's how I see it. How cool. um, the um, the uh, change to Python three has uh, has made any differences to you? Because uh, uh, there's a big uh, big process going on right now of everyone moving from Python two to Python three, and there's some backwards compatibility stuff being broken and so on. So, what versions do you support, and does it cause you any problems supporting different versions of Python moving to Python three and so on? Yeah, with with the recent versions, we support from uh, Python two point five to Python. 2.7, so the, the recent of uh, two uh, two branch, and Python 2.3. I haven't done like any work on it myself. People have made some progress contributing, but haven't seen like a, a pull request yet. So right now we don't we don't support it. I I I, don't, I usually I event is like a bit of free time project for me, so I don't use Python 3 yet. So mm -hmm. I'm waiting for someone else to contribute or for me to switch to Python 3 to work someone 
some uh, uh, something should happen. But after we release 1.0 version, I would be really interested in the pull requests and patches and maybe also doing some work on it myself. It's not a big library, so it shouldn't be uh, too hard, but at the same time it uses objects like sockets, SSL objects, subprocess, which uh, change somewhat from uh, Python 2 to Python 3. So it's mm -hmm. not just an automatic process of uh, mm. fixing syntax. Have you had syntax. requests at all? Have people asked you for Python 3 support? Do you get that kind of thing a lot, or is it not something that's come up yet? Yeah, it's come. It comes up a lot, and so there is an issue open. And people ask for it, and I even said, "Well, there's no point asking. Just make a pull request, patch." Yeah, but yeah, I know that it's in well demand. Yeah, that's something that should be should be added. Mm. And um, another thing I was curious about, which is uh, people who've heard me on Floss before talking about anything to do with Python will know I have this strange obsession with PyPy, which is Python written in Python. Uh, I'm, have you looked at PyPy at all? And I'm assuming that would this work with PyPy? I'm assuming it wouldn't at the moment. Uh, yeah, I have looked at PyPy, and it's a very interesting project. And in fact, uh, Armin Riga, the author of Greenlet module, actually works on PyPy. And the nice thing about PyPy is that it has all this uh, uh, stackless module built in. So it has stackless module, it has greenlit module, it has this functionality for switching stacks. So we can, uh, at some point, uh, port GVN to PyPy. But at, at this moment, uh, this they say have some difficulties uh, uh, merging JIT which is just a time compiler, which actually speed up Python program, and this stack switching capabilities. So if you use any of stack switching, like Greenlet on PyPy, it actually becomes slower than on CPython currently. So as soon as they fix that, I don't know what's on their roadmap and how hard it's to fix, but I assume they will at some point, then it will be interesting yeah, to port GVN to PyPy because, well, Python is lagging behind in terms of uh, interpreters and JIT and face and serious competition from JavaScript and other languages. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely exciting times for that kind of thing. Um, so if I were to uh, want to deploy this on a, uh, on a server or something to build, build an application, what do I need? You mentioned, uh, I think there's, you mentioned a little bit about Apache, but um, I think uh, there's uh, G-Unicorn I was reading about, which is very commonly used with G-Events. So how does all that stuff tie together? What would I need to do to, to kind of get it all up and running? Yeah, G-Unicorn or UWSGI are the like, containers which do the process stuff, demonizing uh, all these things that are not part of the uh, GVN framework. And most importantly, what they do is they automatically spawn a few processes. So if you have four cores, you can run GVN in four cores, like uh, taking advantage of all of them. Uh, how do you do that? I, I, I don't know. I think it's you just... It's pretty straightforward. So you make your application, you uh, provide an entry point to Green Unicorn, and set some options, so configure login and and run it. Hmm. And and what well, what kind of services? Where, is G Unicorn the one that most people would use then? Um, would would you use uh, any other kind of is, website? Is, is used to host uh, HTTP servers. It's for web applications. Right. So if you've written mm -hmm. something in Django, Flask, Pyramid, whatever web framework, or even if you use WebSockets, then you use uh, uh, green, green Unicorn. Oh, okay, excellent. Um, so um, I'm curious to know what, what people are doing with this. Uh, you know, what, what, any projects you can tell us about that you know of that are using G-Event that you think are exciting or doing cool things with it? Um, you mentioned Spotify. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, Spotify, this one project, uh, Discuss, Pinterest, well, this Twilio, this are the companies that I know use Gvent and I'll do some closed uh, work with it. I'm on the open source project. I've seen uh, a cool one, Locust.io, which does a lot of testing, which nice reports and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there's a whole page on GitHub uh, with, the, with the open source projects. On top of GVN, but mo but mostly it's like libraries that enhance uh, GVN in some way. And since GVN is more commonly used in like web applications, which are just hosted somewhere, uh, mm. there's not. I'm not sure if there is much source to see. Mm. And you mentioned that it's a bit of a um, a labor of love, if you like, a bit of a, a passion project for yourself. So, 
how many people work on it? Is it? It's not a full time, uh, not a full time professional thing for you. G event. It's a side thing. Yeah, right now it's not a full time professional thing. There is uh, one other regular contributor besides me, but I still do most of the work and. Well, a number of people contribute patches, but you can't call them regular contributors. But uh, the thing about Jivan, there is a small library, so it's okay to have one maintainer because it's just this coroutine core and, and event loop, and that's it. Unlike, say, Twisted, which provides all kinds of protocols, uh, we don't do it because you can just use the protocols well, the written for standard library. So Redis Pi, you don't need to Redis a client for Jivan, you can just use the standard one. And that, that applies to a lot of libraries. Even in standard library, there is HTTP uh, clients and the POP client, and they all can be used with Gvent and made asynchronous by Gvent. Yeah, okay. And how, how would pe if people wanted to get involved and, and contribute and stuff, how can they can they do that? You've got a is it a GitHub repo you've got right now, so they could yeah, uh, pull it's the some, code. Some, yeah, sure. Huh? It's a standard uh, modern way: GitHub issue tracker, pull requests, mailing list. Everything, everything is available. So if you if you can contribute, please do. And a lot of people do, and I try to merge pull requests on on time. Mm, excellent. excellent. We've actually got a couple of uh, questions from the chat room, which is uh, RIRC chat room, which is going to uh, uh, speed in along here as we're talking. Um, we got one from Brent Eleven, who says, uh, "Does Dennis know if G Event works with Scrapey? Currently, we have to use Twisted. Uh, I don't know. Do you know anything about that one?" Um, I'm not sure. I don't know Scrapey really mm -hmm. what it is. No, I, I'd like to say I did, no. but I, I'd be lying if I did. I'm afraid. Um, so I'll have to, you'll have to look into that one. Um, yeah, but um, he's also Brent's got another question. He's um, he's keen on the questions. He wants. He's curious to know what Pinterest is using uh, G Event for. Pinterest is very popular right now. So uh, what are they doing with it? Yeah, the one of the developers contacted me. Asked me some question about the release. Said uh, they uh, they using it, and mm. uh, well, I haven't contacted them since. I, I usually ask the companies to write a success story, but uh, well, sometimes they reply, sometimes they don't. So you have to wait on it. I don't know. I don't know for. But they say they use it pretty heavily, and they say they think they're the largest user of G event. So it must be something interesting. I, I try to get a success story of them. I have a page where I put well how people use G event on the gvan.org website. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, I have to ask the, the licensing questions and so on. What, what license is Gvent under? It's a very liberal MIT license. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what, what made you go for that one? Was it, was it something that you spent a long time kind of thinking about, or was it just one? No, no, because I was, uh, I, the Gvent was inspired by Eventlet, and uh, at some point used some code from Eventlet and was already licensed MIT. So to make something like compatible, uh, competitive, I had to well use uh, open license. I don't really care about limiting people with GPL and I don't care about, well, I, I wanted this to be used. And this, I think the going with the liberal license is like the way to go if you want something to, uh, to be popular. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, okay then. So um, I'm just curious to know um, how sites. You you said you've got a company called SiteSupport.com. How does that relate yeah. to? Kind of talked a little bit. But how does that relate to GEvent? Are you working around supporting GEvent through the company, and or, or how does that work? Uh, we use GEvent uh, at the company for our backend servers. Uh, GEvent mm. is actually how I met my co-founder because uh, my co-founder Nicholas PL has started SiteSupport. Dot com. He used G event. That's how we got in touch, uh, and I decided to join him. So uh, yeah, we uh, we use it ourselves. So the, the whatever is in the trunk, that that what we have deployed. Hmm. And um, and we we always like to get kind of personal stories from developers on the show. How did you get into open source development, and how did you get specifically into developing uh, G event? Is uh, is it been a long history for you with open source? I mean. <laughs> uh, well, the company I worked for before making Gvent were actually full uh, open source. So what I made was open source. And uh, uh, I don't know how I got really involved. But before that, even before that, I would work in the uh, research institute in Novosibirsk. It's a bootker nuclear research institute. And obviously, they use lots of open source and Linux. So, and uh, well, 
This is if you want a network server these days, you have to go for some uh, Linux or FreeBSD, but n not for Windows, obviously. Yeah. Mm. Okay. It's, uh, so, um, so it's been you've been doing this quite a while then, and uh, I mean, it's great to hear that you know. Obviously, I'm a Linux fan, so it's great to hear you, <laughs> you uh, extol the virtues of Linux there. Um, but what what made you go for Python specifically as a language? Was it something about Python that attracted you, or is it did you just kind of drift into it? Uh, well, I, I think I started as a working professionally as a C C plus plus developer, but there are lots of opportunities where C plus uh, plus is just gives you too slow development. So you want something better. And I was looking at scripting languages, and I realized that writing something in Python takes me like a few times less time than C plus plus. So if if the task doesn't require this absolute speed and uh, close to metal performance then using python can save time as well and make it more fun so i was in in, in the earlier jobs i was uh, hired for the c++ work but often i tried to replace it with python where it was uh, uh, suitable and yeah it is, this is what i use since but um, yeah Excellent. Okay, then. And um, I was just curious what the kind of... Uh, I'm always interested in the challenges and things that uh, you face developing projects like this that developers face. So what do you think the biggest challenge has been in, in developing G-Events so far? And, and uh, what are you most proud of about it? Um, what am I most proud of? It's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a... Uh, I, I don't know. I did, I, I'm I'm glad that it got so popular as it is. I didn't expect it when I published it. I just wanted to initially. I just wanted to do something for myself that works, and I'm glad that it's uh, used by. Well, I, I think it's one of the pop, most popular frameworks for Python now, and I'm, it's just uh, it's cool that it is. I guess that's what I'm proud of. But the, in development challenges. Uh, mm. um, I'm not not quite sure from the top of my head. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm sort of interested in how the community is around this. I mean, part of the thing is like, you know, we, we've actually sort of been struggling for the last 20 or 30 minutes to f ask interesting questions because this is so... <laughs> It's such a mundane thing. I mean, it it you, you, you give it you give it things to do, and it does them in parallel. Uh, what's what's the most unusual thing about G event? Most unusual thing about G uh, I can say I can say what the most controversial thing about G event. Oh sure, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, the controversial thing, uh, but also very useful is uh, is monkey patching. So in Python world, you are not supposed to do monkey patching. It's okay in Ruby. Uh, excuse me, is, I'm, I'm still on? Yeah, you okay. are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it's okay in Ruby, but in Python, it's like... And that's why the module called monkey, because, well, it does something that is not really uh, good. But it's, it's so useful that, well... You, you you may not do it, but uh, you should. So this is kind of controversial. People always have oh monkey passion. I don't want to do this. It, and sometimes it's rational. But if it helps you, then well, why not do it? And in fact, the, uh, because Python is so averse to monkey patching, nobody else does it. And the monkey patching gives you problem when two libraries conflict with what they patch. But because nobody else does it, it, it has been working uh, working out quite well. Yeah, I think if you write a library in Ruby and you don't monkey patch, I think they laugh at you. I think that's probably part of the requirement. So, hey, for, for the, and I know that some of the audience knows what monkey patching is, but why don't you describe that since obviously you're doing it? Um, it it's taking an object. Well, it it was at least in the in the terms that I do it. It's taking a class or a function in a Python standard library that all the other libraries are built are built upon, and replacing it uh, with with your own implementation. So this is the kind of monkey patching that I do, and I need to do it because if I if I don't, uh, then uh, for example the socket. A call will block the whole process and will not give my event loop a chance to run and schedule other processes. So I have to do it, and uh, well, that's how we do it. It's just it's very simple. It's because Python is so dynamic, you can do it easily, and well, it doesn't uh, protect against it or anything. 
Okay, so so in, in essence, what it's doing is, if I if I can understand this properly too, and explain it a little bit, also for the audience, um, you you have a call. You normally have a call to socket, and normally or, or some socket read operation or whatever, and normally that would block because it has to wait for the actual connection to be made or the actual line to be read from the socket. You're going in with your code and replacing that line of code or that, that call to that code with a call to your code that knows how to go into the event loop. But you also have to still be able to ultimately call the socket call, so you also have to save the original somewhere and use it deeper in your code. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yeah, that's true. That's correct. And in fact, well, all the originals are saved and, and available. So if you really need them, well, you, you can use them. And in Python, you can only do this at the Python level, which is why the like the MySQL library can't be properly monkey patched because it's calling the actual C level socket call. Correct? Yeah, exactly. That's the limitation. So if you have a C library, you need to run it through Chatpool. It, it is one thing I like about, about Perl. A Perl, in fact, uh, you can monkey patch any call that the can be made at the Perl level. And you're right; it, it, the same problem would be true at the C level. But hardly anything calls the C level stuff in Perl because the the Perl level stuff is so low level that it's usually okay to just stay at that level. Um, yeah. Um, so we're almost out of time here. So I just want to make sure that we've covered everything that you wanted to cover about G event. Um, is 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 this is this hard to get my head around if I'm just starting with it? Or is there, are there tutorials available? Is there good examples of how to use this available? Uh, there is an introduction on the website. There is a community maintained tutorial called g -Event Tutorial. If you Google for it, you'll have some nice explanations. Uh, there are tutorials for specific topics written not by me, but by community. Well, how to do socket I.O. with Django, how to do web sockets or with g -Event. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you if you Google for G1 tutorials, you'll you'll find a few. Okay, and uh, and uh, so go ahead. Yeah, I don't think it's hard at all because the programming model it gives you is so familiar, so you don't even need that much documentation because a lot of things are just reimplementations of uh, things from the multi threading world. Okay, and and so what's What's in the future for uh, G event? Are you you say you were going to rewrite it based on some other event model, event loop? Yeah. So uh, Node.js project has uh, uh, developing a new uh, event loop. It was originally based on LibEV, but then they go into a bit different direction. But it has all the right features that we actually need in, in the event loop. And on top of that, like thread pool, process management, that's all things that gets re-implemented by every event loop. And then the PyPy project has this stacklet, uh, stack switching functionality written in C. So what I'm experimenting with right now is combining the two and implementing G event at a sort of a C level. Then you can, of course, make a Python wrapper for it, but you maybe you can make a Ruby wrapper for it, I don't know. But, and it will be much better performance than G event that we have now. Well, that'll be awesome. So uh, do you, are you looking for assistance in helping to develop that code? Are you looking for anybody in particular to help you with your project? Yeah, of course, sure. I I want to first, of course, publish it on GitHub, whatever there is, and well, announce it on the mailing list on Twitter. So if you if you want to help, if you're interested, I think it's a very cool project. Uh, you, you watch for the Twitter for link to GitHub. I will post it uh, at some point when it uh, doesn't crash as much. Very good, very mm -hmm. good. I, I I don't know if I don't know if this is politically correct to ask, but somebody in the chat room actually wants to know what your accent is. What what's your native mm -hmm. language? I'm Russian. I'm Russian. I just have been there for a few months, but I have lived in Russia uh, for the most of, of my life. Very awesome. Very awesome. Cool. Well, I, I hope we didn't take offense at that question, but it's like you, you have an <laughs> accent and did this different from mine. I probably have an accent to you. So, hey, it all works out. Okay. Anyway, so I want to thank you very much for being on the show today uh, and chatting with us about G-Event. Uh, th thank you for inviting me. I was very glad good. to be there. Very good. That was uh, Dennis Bilenko, who uh, speaks to us uh, from Amsterdam, talking about G-Event. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, really uh, fascinating, um, fascinating project. I've, I've got to be honest. When I when I looked at this, I thought 
another one? Do we need do we need another one? Because yeah. um, I don't know, Twisted seems to be very popular and then Actually, when when we got talking about it, and when he said that you know you've got Pinterest, uh, you've got people like Spotify using it, I thought, well, they probably know more than I do about this. So chances are, this really is a, you know worth having and a great project. Um, it's it's still quite a, a young project, I would say. I would say, I mean, two thousand and nine, not that long ago. Um, so it seems like they're doing really well, and um, it seems that he's uh, very keen on changing things as well. We just talked there about changing the uh, the model behind it, the event uh, driven model behind it, and so on. So it sounds like a very dynamic uh, project as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I like these kind of projects because it's. It's sort of the, you know, as I sort of alluded to a little bit earlier, it's, it's sort of the mundane. It's, it's this, this solves a problem. It solves a very interesting and important problem, but it's not sexy like, say, Apache is or something like that. But it's it's nice that, that people are, like, finding their niche in here and going, here's a problem that isn't being solved very well yet, but I can make a contribution to it and really contribute to a lot of other projects that are happening on top of that. Uh, and, and, I, and I like that. I, I, I also like to say I, I had to grin a little bit that he brought up Node.js. I went, well, geez, we just interviewed those guys last week. So, um, <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's an interesting connection already there. And how and that also shows me a lot that, that it, doing open source, there's a lot of layering of things on top of other things that there's, you know, that there's, there's you know, like that without, without like say WSG, WSGI uh, interfaces mm -hmm. or, or G Unicorn interfaces, you know, this wouldn't have as much functionality. It wouldn't be as interesting, but because we have all those other things that we can plug together, this is, this is pretty amazing. Mm, yeah, the, the glue between the different projects, uh, definitely. And it seems as though, I mean, it, it's almost two or three years out of date, probably this statement now, but it seems as though these asynchronous uh, development uh, models and asynchronous applications where, you, you know, you, you're not necessarily connected all the time, you're going to be moving from place to place, they're really becoming so popular now and everybody's excited about things like uh, oh, Couch, CouchDB, that's like last year's cool thing. Again, I'm out of date probably. But, Couchbase, um, you know, this Couchbase. Asynchronous model. Couchbase, not CouchDB yeah, anymore. Well, they, Couch Touch TV is gone. Go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's how out of date I am. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, yeah, but th it seems like asynchronous uh, programming, it seems to be where all the cool kids are right now, what they're interested in. Well, I, I mean, it's really the it's really the way to get scale because you know you've got these machines and and you got you got two ways to scale. You can either get a whole bunch of more hardware. Uh, like my current client here has got 50 machines in the cloud somewhere and they're serving up, you know, 300 transactions a second uh, across the, the whole base. But inside each of those, you have to have something like, well, they've got Apache talking to a Couchbase instance to uh, basically generate the data. And you have to figure out how to make that scale. And so you have to have this notion of uh, cooperative processes and thinking about different things all working in together with each other and making things work. So um, it, it's, 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 it's the day. I mean, it, 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 we, you know, we're, we're in a society where everybody can pick up their smartphone and, and go online mm -hmm. with something, and we have to have some way to serve all that. Yeah, that's true. And uh, you've got new challenges as well. Like, if, if you, obviously, you could always lose network connection, but people on uh, cell phones, exactly, you know, they might go in a tunnel on the train, they might, you know, whatever. You, you, chances are your connection's going to be less uh, stable. So you want to be able to keep keep the applications flowing. Yep, and this is definitely, uh, if I was a Python programmer, I would definitely be looking more at this. Uh, uh, I'm not, so this actually is one of the few times I'm doing a show where I probably won't be paying much attention to the fact that we actually interviewed the guy. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Dennis. It's not personal. It's just <laughs> I'm not a Python programmer. I like to indent my code as I choose, not how Guido indented it. Yes, so... <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I'm sorry. Was like, were you waiting for me to come back on that? No, I thought I'd let you. I thought I'd let you. I thought I'd let you have that one for now. Uh, now yeah, um, I was sort of waiting for a for a Python comeback for you, but that's okay. It's it's true. We don't have to have that at all. Let the Python community down. I, I ashamed. I should go and hang my head in shame. I think. You know, Guido's a good guy. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna diss him, except to say that I'm probably not ever gonna use Python. So there we go. Uh, anyway, so speaking of upcoming guests, uh, which is my awkward transition for the day, uh, we have next week we have Concrete CMS, which is a CMS made for marketing but built for geeks. I love that catchphrase, which is why I had to cut it up and paste it into my little list here for things coming up. So of course, content management systems, uh, ways to build websites and web frameworks and things like that. So that should be pretty fun. I don't even know what language is written in. I guess I'll have to find out. Well, we'll find out next 
next week, I guess. Um, uh, following that, we have Auphonic, which is an automatic audio post-production web service for broadcasters and podcasters. Uh, a, a bit of an unusual show, as I said a couple times ago, uh, in that it's a service that uses all open source behind the scenes. And we're going to talk to them about how they do that and why they chose the kind of stuff they chose. But it's not itself an open source project. So um, a bit unusual for this show, but uh, I figure you'll forgive me every once in a while to be able to uh, do that. Uh, Tapper, which is a test infrastructure. Uh, Media Goblin, a media publishing platform that can basically make it so you can have your own Flickr or YouTube or whatever. So Tonic, which is an Erlang-based web framework in CMS. We had... Uh, we had a Haskell-based framework a couple of shows ago. Uh, Cake PHP, which is, uh, as it sounds, a PHP web framework. Uh, Poodle, uh, which is a web-based translation framework where people can cooperate on providing translations for your software. Uh, really looking forward to the Dart language. That's the language being developed at Google that uh, uh, is native in Chrome, but also translates down to native JavaScript for all the other browsers. Should be pretty cool. And finally, wrapping up Q1, we've got Pinto, which is a local localized CPAN, which should be all great. Uh, if you go to twit.tv slash floss, you can see the spreadsheet linked from there, which has all these shows and more, including the dates and times and stuff. Um, if there's somebody uh, that you want on the show that isn't on that list, have the project leader email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, and I will add them to the list and get them probably into Q2 because I'm going to open up Q2 uh, pretty soon here for uh, being able to book them. Um, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. I post there uh, every time I add a new guest or just before the shows actually air. We also uh, I also post to Floss Weekly on both Twitter and Identica to, uh, for immediate notices and stuff. Uh, we have a live chat room, as you saw. We had a couple of actual questions. <laughs> actual questions, as opposed to theoretical questions, yeah. A couple of actual questions today from the chat room. We're on live.twit.tv at uh, 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays is our typical taping time. You can follow me personally at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. Uh, you can also follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google+. Uh, and just as a personal note, I have uh, been continuing to succeed at my weight loss. I'm down about 35 pounds from when I started. Uh, you might see me a little bit thinner if you're looking at the video. Uh, that's not a special effect on the camera. That is actually just me being thinner. So all very awesome. Dan, where can we find out more about you? Yeah, well, um, danlynch.org, as it says on the... Uh, I'm trying to put my finger right there on the video. Uh, for, <laughs> yes. for everyone watching the video. Uh, yeah, it's the place to go. Uh, that's my blog. But um, as many people will, will know, I, I co-host a show called Linux Outlaws, which is a weekly uh, show about open source. Obviously, Linux, as it says in the name. But obviously, uh, other things as well, like uh, Android and you know all kinds of open source goodness. But we're actually closing in on our 300th episode. It's five and a... Eight years, five and a half years we've been doing the show now, which is scary when I think about it. So wow. for our 300th episode, we thought we should do something special. So we're actually doing a live show, a live event that people can come to, uh, which we've wonderfully called Linux Outlaws Live, mainly so we can have the acronym LOL um, mm. <laughs> as, our, as our acronym. So uh, yeah, LOL, Linux Outlaws Live works quite well. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be in Liverpool in the UK. Um, apologies to people who you know, can't make it, but hopefully uh, some of you will be within traveling distance. It's on February the 17th uh, in Liverpool, and uh, it's uh, a place called Leaf on Bold Street, which is a, uh, a cafe stroke venue, uh, a bar as well. And uh, tickets are £5, and uh, the proceeds, any, all the proceeds are going to go to the Software Freedom Conservancy, who are doing great work supporting uh, free software projects and stuff, and uh, and keeping, you know, keeping all the, the things, the wheels turning. Uh, free software products. Uh, in the meantime, as I say, if you go to danlynch.org, you can find all of my um, Twitter, G+, uh, all those kind of things in the sidebar on there, so I won't list them all out for you now. Um, but uh, yeah, come along if you can to Linux Outlaws Live if you're within range, and if you're not, check out the show. Uh, if you do a quick search for Linux Outlaws, we'll pop up. Hey, wait, wait, five pounds? You, don't, you guys aren't on the euro yet? Not yet. We're holding out. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're holding out. <laughs> the, the only member of the EU that's not on the euro. I love that. That's uh, that's that's London. No, we're that's not the only England one. We're not, we're not the only one. To be fair, there's something like uh, we won't get too geeky about it. But there's there's 27 nations and only 17 of them are in the euro. So there's another 10 that, apart from us. I don't know who they are, but there's another 10 apart from us. Yeah, because uh, I remember that. I remember I remember having a big pile of euros uh, that, I, that I took with me that I, that I got like the previous time I went to Europe, and then I went, took them again, and then I was in like. I was in like Israel and I went, oh, wait, they don't take euros. What the hell am I doing with these euros? So pretty sad. That's okay. I made it anyway. Uh, they take dollars. 
They take dollars. It's I was fine. Say, don't they take the dollar? Most places seem to take the dollar. Uh, I, I, yeah, pretty much everywhere I go on a cruise ship takes dollars. It's it's really nice because it's sort of like the universal currency for me. So we're pretty cool with that. Yeah, and I, I also want to put a big shout out for uh, you on Linux Outlaws. Uh, you know, uh, frequently I get the request to have Floss Weekly have more current news and stuff, and I just. I don't know. I, I don't have the research time that you that you and and, and Fab have to put into a, a news show, and so I'm really glad that you guys have your show out there to have the weekly stuff. And your show's like almost two hours now, isn't it? I mean, it seems to get longer and longer, right? Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's like um, what's that one? Is it Boyle's Law that um, gas will always expand to fill any <laughs> any void? Uh, we seem to just expand all the time. Apologies to physicists and uh, there, that's terrible, uh, terrible use of of uh, Boyle's law, probably. But yeah, it's almost up to two hours now. So uh, yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're not always that uh, on the on the nail because we have a kind of a week between shows. So sometimes there'll be a, sh a story that's a week old and people write in and go, "Oh, this isn't news. It's a week old." But you know, a week's a long time on the internet, I suppose. I suppose, yeah, especially with so much stuff happening in open source these days. So I'm really glad. Like I said, I'm really glad that Linux Outlaws is out there. It's, it's one of the few sh other shows on open source that I actually continue to listen to because it's just it's, it's it's informative for me to be able to keep, to keep up with what else is happening in the open source world. So, uh, Dan, I want to thank you again for uh, coming in apparently at the last minute, <laughs> thanks to your email situation. Uh, but thanks for uh, co-hosting the show today. No problem. And thanks for thanks for inviting me. It's always a pleasure. Very good, very good. Well, as we say again, every time this about... The, how about if I actually use English? As we say just about every time at the end of the show like this, we'll see you again next week on Floss Weekly.